Hi, and thank you for listening to Season 2, Episode 2 of The Fix, giving you education, solutions, and troubleshooting for the baseball pitcher, featuring pitching motion expert Angel Borelli. I am your host, Joe Janish, publisher of OnBaseball.com, as well as MetsToday.com, which is part of ESPN's Sweet Spot Network. For those of you listening for the first time, Angel Borelli is a scientist who holds a master's degree in sports science. She's been a strength and conditioning coach for 35 years, and for the past 20 years, she's focused specifically on investigating pitching deliveries. So there are pitchers from the little leagues all the way to the big leagues who go to Angel to find the solution that will take them to the next level. She also works with pitchers who are recovering from injuries. Uh, she works out programs that get them back on the mound, and she also finds and corrects the flaw or flaws that led to her injuries, that led to the pitcher's injuries in the first place. So we're going to see if we can get Angel on the line. Um, Angel, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? I can hear Hello. you loud and clearly. Can you hear me okay? I can. Great. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I guess we can we can get started then uh, with... Uh, it's late February. It's actually the last day of February that we're we're um, broadcasting here. And for those of you who missed the last episode, which is Season 2, Episode 1, we talked about pitching mechanics and injury prevention and what people need to look for from pitchers this time of year because, as we know, spring training is and spring practice is the time when we see the most pitching injuries between now and the beginning of the season. Uh, for the pitching coaches... The baseball coaches out there at the amateur levels, uh, we gave you some questions that you need to ask your pitchers at the start of spring practice. Uh, we also talked about this year's theme, the single most important factor for keep for keeping pitchers healthy, which has nothing to do with pitch counts or innings. Well, actually, it does have a little bit to do with it. It's called rest and recovery, which doesn't sound too sexy, but we're going to be talking about it all year this year. And Angel also provided a secret to velocity that all pitchers can start working on right now. And so if you missed any of that and you want to listen, you can go back to episode one, season uh, season two, episode one. Uh, but now we're going to get started with episode two with Angel Borelli and Joe Janish. So, Angel, we, um, we were talking about spring training and, and getting pitchers ready and I keep a, I try to keep an eye on what's happening in spring training with, in the major league camps. And there's something that keeps coming up over and over that I keep hearing from different, from different journalists and different pitchers and managers and coaches. I keep hearing this thing about pitchers, some pitchers having trouble getting loose this time of year. Uh, it takes them a long time to get warmed up. Um, in a lot of cases, this, this has to do with pitchers who are, um, Maybe older, maybe they're you know they're they're in their I mean older you know early 30s mid 30s they may have a hard time getting loose it takes them a little longer. Uh, some of the pitchers coming off of injuries and surgeries they have a little a little trouble getting loose. Uh, so I thought you know this might be a good thing to talk to you about. And what I was thinking was I would like to ask you a few questions about warming up and and like I mean first of all. What does it mean for a pitcher to warm up? I mean, a lot of people just they just say, "Well, I need to warm up. I, I have to go through my warm up." But is there is there an actual definition of warming up? Like, how does a pitcher know for sure when he's completely warmed up, and what does it really mean? Okay, well, and uh, if you study exercise physiology, uh, and we talk about warming up from that perspective, which is actually the way we would want to discuss it, uh, the body has to increase its internal temperature. Because you just want to think of your body like a car that, and of course, you know this better than I because you're in the East Coast. You have to warm your car up because the oil has a certain viscosity. And when it's warm, it's a little more pliable for the engine. And your joints have lubrication that's similar to that. That's one thing. The other thing is is that in your blood, oxygen is being stored so that for increased activity and that oxygen actually has to be released into the bloodstream so that the the body's breathing pattern can actually accommodate the increased activity. So we've got lubrication, we've got breathing, uh, heating up the blood. So warming up actually in physiological terms means 
increasing the state of many systems in the body to accommodate a different level of activity. Now, if the joints aren't warmed up, the muscles aren't going to contract at the speed that they need to contract. When we're walking around, they're contracting slowly. To contract faster, you almost have a little, you need a little more stimulation. You need a little more readiness for that. And it's way more complicated than I'm making it sound, but gives you the general idea. So when pitchers go out to the field, they have to absolutely, joint by joint, warm up their fingers, their wrists, their elbows, their shoulder. They have to warm the joints up so they become lubricated so that the muscle starts to loosen up so that when they start their throwing, that they actually are along with changing the distance of that they're throwing and also the style with which they're throwing. A pitcher doesn't throw at 25 feet to his partner the way he's going to throw at 60 feet. He's going to have a shorter stride. He'll be standing up. He's just playing catch. So as he's moving through those things, he's bringing in more <clears throat> more movements. Now, most, and then pitchers also do a lower body warm-up, and I just actually designed one for the school that I work with. And what you notice is at the beginning of the warm-up, you know, they're feeling, of course, use from the day before, but by the end of the warm-up, they're doing, I have them do similar movements, and they feel way better. And then they are prepared to go to the field where they still haven't reached their optimal level, but where when they start moving, their body's able to start slowly uh, increasing its output. And before you know the run, which was very slow at the beginning, will end up being faster if they're running bases. And the throwing will start to increase its intensity. And this all happens because the body's heating up and because the chemistry of range of motion has to do with the ability to move easily. So range of motion increases and, and, and therefore their performance increases. So that's actually what has to happen. When they say they have trouble uh, warming up, I don't know if I would say that they, <laughs> there is no it takes longer or it takes shorter. Every day could be a different day. Pitchers are not machines. Whatever the pitcher needs, and they pretty much are in tune with what they need. So if a pitcher says, I need 20 pitches in a bullpen to warm up today, and on another day he needs 28, let him have it because he needs to, uh, he's following his own internal clock. So, yes, and at the beginning of the season, remember, they're doing things they don't do all year long. Even if they're throwing, they're not bending over, picking up balls off the ground, doing some of the fielding uh, drills they have to do. So, uh, you know, trying to keep a runner on base. Um, so I think that it's also new use of muscles. And, of course, this will improve over the season. Okay, so... Warming up is is the body physically changing temperature. Like if you took their took a mm -hmm. thermometer, would would they actually be up a degree or two? Yeah, there's an internal change in the heat of the body, and in fact, there's scientists that have looked at the number of minutes. I mean, if you look at physiology books, uh, they say twelve. For example, they'll send you over on a bike for twelve minutes, and they've studied what physiologists do that are in a lab studying. And of course, this is the information I have to apply. They look at how long it takes for a tissue to be able to uh, become more elastic. See, tissue has a lot of properties. And so those properties become are sensitive to different variables. And one of the things that we have in our muscle tissue is elasticity. And that elasticity allows the muscle to change and, and act, let's just say, in an easier manner. In fact, elasticity is what is lost in the ligament once a ligament becomes, you know, overstretched or damaged. And that's why all of a sudden the pitcher's elbow doesn't feel the same way as it does because it's losing its elasticity or it's lost its elasticity. So there are properties of muscles that are healthy, and that's what you want to deal with. So, uh, and I think most sports know this. You go out, whatever you're doing, you start slow and you increase. If you try to go too fast at the beginning, things happen. And that's true for every activity, for every joint. And once you are doing that, you get acclimated to what your own body needs. And it can be different every single day. Okay, well, I'm, what, what's popping into my head right now is uh, Daisuke Matsuzaka, who no longer pitches in the United States. He returned to Japan over the offseason. He had a very extreme warm-up process 
um, when mm-hmm. he pitched with the Mets over the last two years, they were using him primarily as a relief pitcher, and mm-hmm. he he would he would start warming up in the second inning in the bullpen with the idea mm-hmm. that he might be needed in the fifth or the sixth or the seventh. He he would actually start mm-hmm. going down to the bullpen and warming up in the second inning, mm-hmm. and he he would mm-hmm. probably spend an hour and a half warming up. Is that a little extreme? Mm-hmm. Well, actually, you know, it depends on the way you look at it. If I look at a pitcher who says he needs, I mean, he's got to go in and he's got to bring it. A relief pitcher doesn't have time to uh, take the first inning, take the second inning, take the third inning. And they do modulate their intensity because that's just a natural thing. It's like if you go out and you're walking and you know you're going 20 miles, you are going to intuitively modulate how fast you start walking at the beginning. You'll wait till a certain temperature happens, and then you'll all of a sudden your pace will be greater, and at some point you're probably going to feel fatigue and you'll slow down again. This is human nature. He knows his body. He may, in fact, be a starter who's being asked to go in, and he's actually trying to create a sort of a starting situation where he's just going in now in the sixth inning. So it depends on the pitcher himself. Now, if you're asking, could he become fatigued, well, the way that you measure that as a coach is, you know, you do some questioning. You say, hey, you know, you're throwing a lot of pitches. And if he says, I need it, and you put him in, and you see that he's not throwing as hard in his inning as he was in the bullpen, you need to talk to him. I doubt a pitcher would do that because they're aware that they're not throwing as hard in the game as they were in the bullpen, meaning he threw too many pitches for himself. But pitchers don't normally have that kind of error with their own. Uh, you know, they're very different. And the and the uh, uh, Japanese pitchers are known, They have, as many shows have pointed out, their habits are completely different. The way they use their bodies completely different. We don't know what he does off the um, off the field. And so if the performance is happening and then the, whatever he's doing to get ready for it is something you wouldn't want to tinker with. But if he is fatiguing or he's not, he's his first pitches, you know, he, he just looks like the one inning you brought him in for, he doesn't look crisp, then you need to look at that and discuss it with him. Most people have a good sense of what they need prior to whatever they're doing, unless they're little kids. They have no sense at all. You know, they'll throw right. three pitches in a in a bullpen and say they're ready to go in the game. <laughs> so, yeah, right, you right. know, so it, it's different, yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny you said before about how, how a pitcher who maybe is not used to pitching in relief, he might be used to starting and so that he's trying to do that routine to get ready mm-hmm. for relief. That's pretty much exactly what I think Dice K was doing because he has always been a starting pitcher and then he was also all, – uh-huh. you know, thrown into this role of being a relief pitcher, which he'd never really mm-hmm. done before. And I guess this is how he figured it out because he, he never really pitched in relief before. So that makes a lot of sense now that you now that you explain it. Wow. Great. Well I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So that he's he, he knows exactly how every inning feels to him. And again, and this is also a point for everybody to 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 take into consideration. When pitchers come to me to do what I call forensic analysis, find out why there's a problem. What's the cause of whatever problem they're having? And sometimes it is it isn't just pain. It's I cannot find a plate for two innings. And then the third inning, all of a sudden, I'm great. So my first question is going to be, how many pitches do you throw in a warm-up pen? And they'll say, 15. I'll say, well, then obviously that's not enough. Plus, it is. it couldn't be enough. Uh, closers are really good at, at, at that, and they have to be. But how do you find your release point on three or four different pitches if you don't usually even – throw your other pitches till you've thrown at least 12 fastballs. You know, that doesn't leave you any room. So what I do is I put them on the pen and have them start pitching. And I say, okay, we're count, we count every pitch. My catcher, that's his main job, is counting. And we'll, I'll say, we'll let you know when you've reached 10 and then every five after that. And what I want you to tell me is, I want you to tell me exactly when the moment occurs where you have uh, found your release point for all your pitches you feel your body has turned on a few more bulbs than you had turned on at the beginning, and I want you to tell me when you'd be ready. And inevitably, it's going to be between 22 and 28 pitches, and uh, sometimes 20. And so that is one of the first things. When you have a pitcher who has a a rough first inning, make sure he is actually ready when he goes in. 
and not using the first inning to warm up, to continue his warm up, because you don't want him doing that once he's facing hitters. He should be ready. I'm so glad that that you just went over all that because what was going through my mind what were the are these pitchers and there are a lot of them out there who for whatever reason they have a hard time in the first inning um or they have a, or they're one of these pitchers who people say oh you know he gets stronger as as the game goes on and and really mm-hmm. it's just not necessarily that he gets stronger it's that maybe he wasn't ready to start in the first and second inning because he didn't he didn't warm up enough and I think I think that's you know, it, it it seems very simple. Okay, you're having trouble in the first inning every time you go out. Why don't you extend your your pregame or, or your bullpen session before before you start out? And I I don't know. You know, I think maybe pitchers are afraid they need to conserve their energy or something else. I'm not sure what it is, but that's, I'm I'm glad that you pointed that out and, and gave us a better idea of of how to figure out how many pitches you need and, and all that. And I I guess a lot would depend also on how many pitches are in the pitcher's repertoire. I mean, if a guy throws a fastball curve, change-up slider, as opposed to a guy who just throws maybe a fastball and a change-up, I would imagine that there might be a difference in, in how long it takes because you have to, like you said, you have to get all those pitches going, all, the, all of them ready in spots and whatever. Um, uh, you know, right now I think is a good time to point out that you you actually have created a program for warming up that's available on your website at gymscience.com. So I just wanted to I just wanted to point that out that you know that you you've done a lot of research on this and and you do have some tools that are available resources available for pitchers who can um who can put together a better you know a better um pregame and a better warm up program. So uh, thanks again for for um, for going through a lot of that stuff um, and. You know, so, something else else that that's been going through my mind with all this getting loose thing is the injured pitchers, the pitchers that are coming off surgery. It does take them a little longer because something else is going on. I mean, you know, you, you don't know. If, I mean, it's different from case to case, but in a lot of cases, these pitchers need a little bit more time to warm up. It's because there's something else going on in their in their arm or their body after the injury. Is there something different from healthy pitchers? Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, especially in the, uh, well, in the shoulder and elbow, which are, of course, the most uh, frequently injured joints, whenever you have healing taking place, healing is sort of a shortening process. Uh, Tissue has to come together. This could be when you just skin your knee and, you know, you've lost skin and then all of a sudden the skin's trying to repair itself and you'll feel like you have to keep straightening your knee. with the ligament injury in the elbow, uh, this, you'll see them. Uh, the same thing that hurt them before it was uh, uh, repaired will be the first, same movement. You'll see the pitcher is constantly straightening his elbow because the straightening feel, it feels tight when they go to straighten it. And it's because the healing process itself is a process where tissue comes together. And so you're, it's sort of a real estate issue. That's one thing. The other thing is, like in the shoulder, really genius surgeons, you know, if they see somebody with a, a, a labrum tear or they see some uh, tendon that was damaged or some ligament damaged, sometimes when they repair it, they actually repair it shorter to allow for the the, last, the, the lengthening that's going to then take place again because of the skill that the pitcher performs. So sometimes it's part of the surgical procedure. So everything is brought in to make it tight. That's why when you have a joint that's injured, they automatically tighten up the joint. We want the joint close, the bones close together. You know, if somebody breaks an arm or, you know, you strain your shoulder, we want the caps, we want everything to be tight in there. And so it, it's, a, it's, it's part of the nature. That is why rehab is designed, especially the, day, the days following surgery, where passive things are done by the physical therapist so things don't tighten up too much. And then as it tightens up more from the healing, then the, the exercises get a little more aggressive. So you might go from not passive to where you're moving it, and then you might go from that to a tubing, then you might go from that to a one-pound plate, and before you know it, you're in the gym, 10 pounds, 15 pounds. So you're progressively allowing that lengthening to take place. But one of the things that ha- happens with post-Tommy John people, because I work with so many of them, is sometimes even in the middle of pitching, they'll feel it's, it's not tight, then it gets loose, 
and then after a certain number of pitches, it starts tightening up again. It's like the minute it fatigues, your muscles start to fatigue, then the ligament starts feeling tight, and they have to stop, and we always find the right movement for them to do, and we always select an exercise that all my pitchers, of course, do my uh, arm warm-up program. So all those exercises are perfect for every joint. So we always select one movement from there, and the pitcher will go, oh, this is the one that really releases my elbow. And I say, okay, keep your band next to the mound, and when you get there, When you start tightening, you do that. If your pitches then improve again, great. If that doesn't loosen it up, then you're done. That means you're done. And that's how you monitor it. But, yes, they have a completely different situation. They need to be on top of it. And it does get better over time. And you've got to actually stay with where your arm is at. That's how a surgery can go bad, uh, you know, uh, if you don't take care of your arm post-surgically. You've got to really do that. Otherwise, you'll pay the price down the road and your arm will never feel right. And those beginning stages, the tissue is really vulnerable to not only another injury, but it's also vulnerable to great healing if you do the right things to heal. And movement usually is the way you have to do it and it has to be carefully, um, you know, administered. So, yes, you see them doing different things, and there's a reason for it. Okay. So as long as we're on the, the topic of pitchers coming off of injuries and in, at this time of year, uh, there's a there's a particular pitcher that I discussed with you before we came on air, um, Cincinnati Reds pitcher Homer Bailey, who has had a lot of arm injuries in the past with his shoulder, with his elbow. Um, he just had – last year he suffered a, a – or a flexor, a flexor mass strain, um, and he had he had surgery to repair it. I think it was a mild tear of some sort. He had surgery to repair it at the end of last end of the season last year. He's coming back. Um, the Reds are really counting on him to be a a big time pitcher this year. And right now, anyone who is uh, listening and has a computer available to them, I want you to hit pause right here on the podcast. And well, not right this minute, but. I want you to, to uh, open up another window and go to onbaseball.com slash homer, H-O-M-E-R. And if you go to that webpage, you'll see some pictures of, of Homer Bailey that we're going to talk about uh, right now. So go to a, you want to hit pause here, open a window, and go to onbaseball.com slash homer. And we have a couple of illustrations. Um, so Homer Bailey had a... Um, this flexor mass, first of all, I'm not really sure what it, I mean, I know a little bit, but I, maybe you can explain a little bit what a flexor mass strain is. And, okay. And then maybe you can talk talk to us about um, some of the things that Homer needs to be looking out for or things he needs to be correcting or his pitching coach needs to watch for uh, this spring to make sure that this injury doesn't happen again because I'm sure it happened for some reason or another that may or may not have had something to do with his mechanics. So I'm going to let you take the floor and teach us something about um, what to look for from a pitcher who's coming off a particular kind of an injury. Okay, well, he had he had what's called a flexor pronator mass strain, and then it went got so bad that he had to have surgery. The flexor pronator mass is when you look at your forearm with the palm up, you just see that there's a very meaty part, meaty, M-E-A-T-Y, meaty tissue dense part of the forearm right underneath the crease of the elbow. Flexor stands for the flexors insert beneath that crease. Pronator stands for the pronator teres, which is a muscle in the forearm that actually rotates and it's actually what's moving when a pitcher changes his um, release from a curveball release to a slider release to a fastball release. The, pro- the the forearm is actually what's rotating along with the wrist. And um, so, and, and of course, mass means it's where they all come together. All the insertions are sim- in similar places. And actually, most pitchers that have Tommy John surgery had flexor pronator mass strain at one time in their history. It's why, if you've listened to me, I, am, I, I keep drilling it in your head. Do not let forearm strain, fatigue, stress go by because that's the precursor to the ligament completely blowing out. Those muscles have to protect the elbow joint, which protect the ligament. If they get fatigued, the ligament blows. So if he didn't have this surgery, he would have had, 
he would have gone on and ended up with a ligament surgery. With that being said, anybody who's got any activity around the elbow joint, whether it be pain, stress, fatigue, you have to look at certain risk factors for that. And the risk factor that I that you will see when you look at these two photos is, believe it or not, the most common risk factor that I see present in pictures that come to me with pain or symptoms in their um, uh, bicep, in their forearm, uh, in their elbow joint. Uh, and this is, if I see this, because, of course, with the experience I have, the minute they give me those symptoms, the first thing I'm going to do is look at the, the risk factor that's the most common. And I'm seeing it in both these photos. So I want everyone to just take a look at the photos. Now, there's, the, the way I'll talk about the photos is in one photo, he's got really curly hair, hard to miss. And in the other photo, he has a different haircut. In the photo that has the curly hair, he's actually turned his arm over a little more. So we can actually see the bone in the back of the elbow, the point where you would be leaning on if you were leaning on a desk. I want you to notice how straight that arm is pulled. His elbow right there is actually hyperextended, meaning that he's got a little bit of overstretched ligament. If you look at your own arm, it's got sort of an angle to it. It doesn't really go that straight. And actually in the, um, uh, the photo with the shorter hair, his elbow actually does have a, a different angle to it. It would be interesting to know if, if the one with the shorter hair was prior to the longer hair, because in the longer, uh, with the longer hair, he actually looks like his his, uh, his elbow has too much range of motion. So anyway, with that being said, he is committing one of the major crimes that are definitely responsible for ligament strain, and that is not releasing the elbow at the end of a pitch. Pitching coaches, you might see it as, oh, he's not finishing his pitch, uh, on a kinesiological level and a physics level, he's not allowing the bicep to shorten the arm, and which means he is having to exert double the force to keep the arm straight. So his arm should be completely bent, wrapped around. Of course, he can't because his glove arm's in the way. And I don't know. I haven't seen his mechanics. I haven't analyzed it. This is just a JPEG. But... It, it, depending on what his his mechanics are like, he may not be able to finish correctly because of something crazy he does with his glove arm. But in either case, let's assume his glove arm's out of the way. That arm should look like it's completely bent, like he's wrapping it around, trying to touch the number on the back of his shirt. That is not something he has to do. It's something that's happening automatically because of the forces of the extension of the elbow. But when a pitcher stops his arm three-quarters the way through, he's, he actually has to forcefully do that. So he's now creating a movement that is not only incorrect, but it strains the forearm and it strains the elbow. And the way that I know this is true is, one, I know what's supposed to happen in the mechanics. Two, we look at the forces so we know why it happens. But three, in 20 years... I can tell you that by making this correction to probably over 50, 70 pitchers, they get immediate relief in the next pitch from just releasing the elbow. And I have had a pitcher last week come up to me and say he hasn't been out of pain for two years. In this one adjustment I made, he said, I haven't had to hold my elbow. It hasn't ached. It hasn't fatigued. And that's how simple it is. This is probably the number one issue. It's also one of the number one mechanical flaws in youth pitchers. So the pitch does not end. You do not stop the arm. The arm keeps going. The, the bicep will very nicely bend the elbow, and you have to allow that to happen. So this is one of the major risk factors. When you see this in mechanics, it is a risk factor for elbow problems, which could be forearm, bicep, or the um, ultimate problem, which would be a Tommy John uh, type of problem. Okay. Well, that's that's a great a great learning lesson. Um, so, what what do we want Homer to be doing now? How do how do we fix this since this is a fix? We tell him. You tell them. That's all you have to do. Listen, pitchers know how to pitch. You know, my expertise is knowing how to move the body. It's very simple. I mean, I don't have trouble teaching a 9-year-old. I don't have trouble with a 22-year-old. 
my older pitchers who are so sensitive to their own mechanics, they'll do it one time and say, wow. And here's the cool thing about it. The body is sort of task-oriented. And so this is something I know, but it's what I've noticed. If the pitcher understands that his arm needs to keep on going and needs to wrap around his trunk, and again, this is assuming that the glove arm's not in the way, so I don't know what's going on with Homer's glove arm here, but uh, it shouldn't be there right now. Uh, When they know that's where they have to get, they actually go through the ball a little bit more completely, and the pitch ends up... Being having more life to it. And I hear this from the pitchers, but I also can see it. And that's because of something that we, that we innately have. If we know we have to cross the street and get to a certain place, we're walking differently to that place than if we're just meandering and we're kind of confused as to where we're going to go or we maybe are thinking about stopping in the middle of the street. It's just the way our nervous system and our brain works. When the pitcher knows the pitch ends, he releases the ball, he comes diagonally across his body, which you can see Homer's doing, but then that arm continues. He's allowing that continuation because the elbow is doing that all by itself because of how rapidly it was extending. When he allows that to happen he will notice that he goes through the ball differently. Pitchers love this adjustment. All you have to do is tell him. And what I have to do with pitchers is stand in front of them as they're pitching, and just as they start their motion, motion, I say, release your elbow, or I'll say bend your elbow, whatever it is at the end of the pitch. Just whatever it is that works for that pitcher. And they get out of pain, and they love it. And it is correct mechanics. So so the cool thing is it has benefits on performance and also on um, – injury prevention, but listen, pitchers love when they get an adjustment that gets them out of pain immediately, and what it also does is it takes a lot of stress off the back of his shoulder, because what you see here is the exact same thing as driving into a cement wall instead of putting your brakes on slowly as you approach it. So this style of stopping is the way you stop is you drive through the wall. <laughs> and right. The right way is you've used your brakes and boom, you're there nice, safe, and sound, and there's no rough edge to the finish. So that's wow. the, that's... Uh, yeah, it's cool, isn't it? See, things that's, that's aren't really, really cool. that complicated. You just have to know the way the joints and the forces are moving, and you have to make sure that the pitcher is not disallowing you know, things that feel good to the body. And they just don't really always know that, you know. So anyway, I'm really glad to be able to talk about this today. There's about six risk factors in mechanics for Tommy John, but this is the most important one. Wow. So this this is fantastic. So th- this is something every, every coach can do and, and take a look at with their pitchers at any age. Uh, so so we, we've, <clears throat> we've now done a tip to um, to help pitchers avoid pain and avoid injury. How about a tip now to increase pitchers' velocity? And um, I, th- there's kind of an inside joke between Angel and I when we when we first started planning for our season two. Uh, Angel talked to me about adding adding some tips for velocity, and she wanted to do that in every show. And I said, Angel, can you really come up with what's it going to me- we're going to need like 25, 26 tips on velocity, and you know, I I was a little I was a little pessimistic. I didn't think that Angel could come up with 26 different ways to increase velocity. But if you listen to all of our podcasts this season, I put the challenge to Angel, and Angel's going to have to deliver. So, uh, <laughs> and by the way, they're already written down. I immediately got on that challenge, and within 10 minutes, I had I had 14 written down. I had a stall for about a day. Then I started adding to it. And yes, I am at. Uh, I think I'm at 24 or 25 right now. And by the wow. way, these are not the gimmick stuff. These, this is the real stuff. So, uh, <laughs> yes, oh, yeah. it was quite funny. And, yes, I'm up to the challenge, and you know how I am about challenges. So today's tip, everybody, um, as you know, last week we talked about the length of the stride being uh, critical because many of the features of pitchers that throw hard involve trunk tilt. They involve other things with the body that can't be performed if the stride isn't right. And so since last week I talked to you about moving to the side of your pitcher and taking a look at him, 
from the side and looking at the length. And, of course, you can listen to the podcast to get the details. Today I want you to move to the back of the rubber. And what I want you to do is I want you to look at where the pitcher's foot is landing, uh, how far to the right or left. So let's take a right-handed pitcher, and I want you to look at uh, how far over to his right or his left foot is landing. So I just want to remind everybody that when you, if you think about yourself right now walking upstairs, you're going to always have your feet somewhat apart from each other. They look just like they do when you're standing up straight and just standing with your two feet underneath you. We always have a little space between our feet because our hip joints are spaced in such a way that the feet, you know, hang from below it. And so when we walk, we're in balance because we walk forward. As you know, if you try to walk like on a tightrope, even if you take a line outside or you get on the curb and you try to go one foot in front of the other, your body goes into an immediate state of trying to keep you in balance. So what we want to do in athletics, especially in a skill where there has to be a certain positioning towards the target, it's just like I'm sure that if anybody um, hunts or does certain thing with guns or whether you shoot a bow and arrow, you have to have your lower body in a position where what you can do is focus on the target, hitting the target, and not have your body be trying to keep you up in space. One of the problems that pitchers have is they do, now in baseball language, and I've never understood this, you guys call it, throwing across the body. I've tried every which way to figure out why you call it that, and I honestly don't know, but this is what uh, I am talking about. When the right-handed pitcher strides out, if his left foot is too far over to the right, and when you're standing behind him, behind the rubber, and you're looking at him when he's throwing a pen, and when he lands, and if you have film and you see this, you won't be able to see the front foot. You'll see the back foot. The front foot's directly in front of the back foot, and he is what I call pitching on a tightrope. Now, the minute that design takes place in the lower body, the body goes into doing what its first job is. The first job of the spine and the nervous system is to keep you standing up. And if that becomes the job, then the rest kind of falls apart. Plus, on a muscular level, the pitcher develops velocity by the way he goes from his sideways position, which is on balance, to stride, and then he starts to turn. It's in that turning that the velocity really starts to have an impact on the shoulder velocity. If you are on a tight rope, you cannot have adequate rotation. So the importance of having a stride where when you're standing behind him, he looks like he just lunged out. So if any of you are in the gym and you do lunges and you look in the mirror, you'll lunge out with your left foot. You'll be able to see your right foot. And then you're able to, you know, you're not even, you're working on your muscle strength and then you pull the leg back. When a pitcher lands and once he turns his back leg over, that's exactly how he should look. And then you know that he gave room to all the other factors that have to happen next to be able to throw the ball hard. Remember, it's a series of movements that add up to contribute to the ability of the arm to do its thing, which it does so well. If you block your own velocity by having the kind of faults that you'll be hearing from me, that means you have velocity stored up in your body that you're not using. That is great news, and that is why you don't have to run around looking for something to bring into yourself to throw harder, make sure your body's not blocking the velocity that's already in it. You should never even be worrying about increasing your velocity until you're sure you're not making these errors. Once you correct these, it always it always improves a performance. So stand behind your pitcher. Make sure he's not on a tightrope when he lands. If he is, mark a spot in the sand, have him walk out, do a lunge off the rubber, mark the sand, this is where a foot should be, and tell him what needs to happen. And again, athletes are task-oriented. They make their body do what it's supposed to do if you, like, draw a line in the sand and tell them. And if that doesn't work, then uh, you have to do work with the back hip. But basically, that's an error that you want to look for to unblock the miles per hour that are stored up in the rotation that the pitcher is not getting 
because he didn't land correctly to allow his hips to move correctly. And that's my tip number two out of the 26 you'll hear from me this season. <laughs> so, well, that that sounds that sounds a lot easier and a lot less expensive than going out and buying a a, a bunch of weighted balls or 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 any of these other crazy contraptions that I've seen in in the backs of uh, baseball magazines. I, you know, and honestly, you know, p- pitchers, parents, coaches, stay away from all the crazy gadgets out there and then the the heavy balls and the light balls just just listen to the podcast every week you're going to get a new tip on velocity every week it's going to be based in science it's going to be based on how the body moves because that's where velocity comes from it doesn't come from any of these other crazy places just you, you, you have the right process and you're efficient and angel will teach you how to do that so just keep tuning in um so we are at the end of our end of our show I want to thank everyone again for listening to our conversation. Uh, Joe Janish here with pitching motion expert Angel Borelli. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about Angel's background and how she takes pitchers to the next level, you should visit her website. It's gymscience.com, G-Y-M-S-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. Uh, you can find a lot of great information and articles on pitching mechanics and injury prevention there. Uh, one of the great tools that's available there is her first pitch strike warm up and recovery program for the pitching arm. It's a it's, it's there's no other program out there. It's a, it's a it's a DVD and a and a workbook and it takes the whole idea of arm preparation and repair to a, an entirely new level. Um, and I, I strongly suggest you go to gymscience.com and check that out. Uh, Angel also wrote the book Engineering the Pitching Elbow, which is full of strength and conditioning exercises specifically for the elbow. Uh, includes a full program for keeping the arm healthy during the off season and in the in season. So if you don't want to tear your UCL. You don't want to be one of those people that's famous for Tommy John surgery. Get the book. Um, again, gymscience.com. For more about me, you can visit you can visit onbaseball.com. You can follow me on Twitter at onbaseball. Again, thanks so much for listening. Hope you learned a little bit. Once again, I learned quite a bit. Uh, we wish you safe and effective performance on the pitching mound, and see you next week.